Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith. I'm the publisher of Backstory Magazine over at www.backstory.net and obviously the host of the Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast on iTunes and Spotify. And for our online Comic-Con, I'm very pleased to have with us as our guest, screenwriter David S. Goyer, right there on your screen. Uh, and so, you know, I, I miss everybody at Comic-Con. I've, I've been coming down to San Diego since the old 20th century. Like I've, I've been there for de decades. I've never missed one. And, it, and, it, and it's really tough to miss it, but it's doing the right thing to, to have a socially distanced Comic-Con. And I think that's the best yeah. place to start. David, what, what is one of your favorite memories of Comic-Con over the years? It could be anything. Well, like you, I mean, I don't remember the first one I went to. It was probably at least 25 years ago. I remember going down when, you know, there weren't all these fancy parties being thrown by the studios and agencies that were impossible to get into. And uh, before there were, you know, when it seemed like 30,000 people was a lot, uh, as opposed to 130,000. But, um, I mean, when I first started going, you could, you could run into just randomly creators that you admired, you know, all over the place. They weren't mobbed. And you could get artwork for a reasonable price, you know, original artwork. And so it was possible to wander around and, you know, buy a Neil Adams page or, you know, whatnot. Um, it, since then, everything's skyrocketed and it's, it's just become sort of like, uh, almost like once the studios discovered Comic-Con, it's, 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 it's still fun to go, but it's, it's a different kind of experience. There's just a lot more people. It's, it's a little busier, a little busier. Oh, it's, not, it's, not possible I mean, to socially so, distance. Not possible to socially distance. I have three sons and I still have only brought my oldest son down to Comic-Con because I've just nightmares of like losing my youngest to, you know, in the throngs. But one of my favorite, most favorite memories was maybe, I want to say five years ago, I was there promoting something. And um, we were in the green room, which is like the holding area that they put you sometimes before you go out on stage or you're doing interviews. And I looked over and Stan Lee was just sitting at a table by himself. And I'd known Stan. We'd gone out to lunch a few times and we were friendly. And um, he was utterly by himself. And I just came over and I said, hey, Stan, it's David. And... I think he actually was happy to see someone that he knew because it was just, uh, again, this was only about five years ago. And um, I don't know, we chatted for about 20 minutes. Just uh, again, he was just completely sitting there by himself there to promote something. I'm not sure what. That, that's awesome. I was lucky enough to have him on one of my panels a, a few years ago. And he, he was always a great interview and couldn't have been a nicer guy as well. Um, you know, I, I think to to start about your career, one of the one of the you know all, all Comic Con fans that that enjoy your work as as a, as a writer as a creator, um, they they do owe a small debt of gratitude to Jean Claude Van Damme, who helped you get your first film made, 1989's yeah. Death Warrant, um, and uh, you know the first comic book adaptation that you did, which is what we're focusing on, is the the art of it, adapting comics for the screen was. The Crow City of Angels. Yes. And I'm curious what you learned about the art of adaptation because as a writer, it's always so difficult to figure out what are the important elements to move over from the page to the screen while still telling a story that's cinematic. And with that, it's actually a sequel as well. So what was, what was your biggest lesson on, on Crow City of Angels? Crow City of Angels was uh, a master class in how not to adapt a comic book, <laughs> what not to do. Um, I, you know, I, I had read the original uh, um, comics by James um, Obar, and, um, and I actually met and known Brandon Lee and thought that Proyas' film was amazing. Uh, when they approached me to do the sequel, I, I really didn't want to do the sequel. It just, it, it felt wrong to do it. And they, they kept coming back at me and coming back at me. And, and I said, well, 
this is also a lesson in the fact that the screenwriter in film doesn't always drive the shots. But I said, I'll, I'll do it, but only if um, the title character can be a female and not a male, because I don't want to in any way try to sully Brandon Lee's memory or compete with that. I don't want to find a Brandon Lee lookalike. And so we agreed and I wrote this, this treatment um, that involved um, actually Jack the Ripper and one of Jack the Ripper's victims um, who was pregnant at the time when she was killed. And then she was reincarnated into modern times along with um, the bad guy. And I think I wrote a 20 page treatment and and that got approved and then uh, miramax who were distributing it that supposedly didn't have any kind of editorial oversight immediately threw that out the window and they said we we, we want to do it with a guy who looks like brandon lee and and so every and i what i should have done is just quit the project but um i didn't and uh it was a miserable experience what can i say um, I got to meet Iggy Pop, who actually uh, is from my hometown, Ann Arbor, Michigan. So that was cool. But yeah, it was it was not fun. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's interesting because when people look at your IMDb, they notice that that right after that, you're jumping in into the Marvel universe with with David Hasselhoff as Nick yes. Fury, Agent of Shield. But but it's actually a project that you weren't as involved with. Just just briefly, give us give us the the background on that really briefly well um i originally wrote a draft of nick fury uh, as the feature film um and you know marvel at the time was obviously not the marvel that they are today they weren't even close and um i think it was the first thing i adapted possibly even before blade and it was a fairly representative adaptation of kind of the Steranko era, but updated, you know, with um, Strucker and the Satan Claw and all sorts of things like that. And um, and then, uh, you know, nothing ever happened to it. It went into development hell. And I think the studio that had the rights lost the rights. And, and then years, years later, uh, after Blade had been made, um, some people called me and said, hey, we're going to make a series of backdoor pilots for Fox and good news. Um, we've optioned the Nick Fury uh, script that you wrote. And I think I, at the time, I, it was intended to be made for something like $20 million, which doesn't seem like a lot of money in today's blockbuster standards. But it was a decent sized budget back then. And they said, but, you know, we have to make it for $3 million or $4 million or something like that. And I just said forget it. I don't want to be involved. And, uh, they had someone else rewrite it and someone direct. I, so I had absolutely zero involvement with the TV version and it was fairly significantly rewritten. You can, I think that you have to rewrite the writer's guild says something like up to 35 or 33% yeah. get credit, yeah. but somebody can write 30, rewrite 30% of the script and not get credit. And a lot of the movies that you see have had other people's hands in them. And um, so you just sort of sit there helplessly and they say, well, they bought this script. They can do whatever they want with it. They can change whatever they want. They can cast whomever they want. And that's all you can do. It's, it's out of your hands. Let's get to 1998's Blade, which was definitely in your hands. It, 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 it has an African-American as the superhero. And it was, you know, it was, it was based on a previously existing comic. And it was, you know, it was coming on the heels about a year after Spawn as well. But you had been working on it long mm. before that. Because Spawn also had an African-American yeah. uh, protagonist and was based on a comic. Um, and you had been working on it before that. What was it like when you first got involved with Blade? And what were the parameters that were set down for taking those stories and putting them in context, not only as a comic book movie, but as an R-rated comic book movie, which was also something that was still kind of, kind of new at the time? Well, um, uh, I knew Mike DeLuca, who was the president of production at New Line. And uh, I knew Mike was a longtime comic book fan, specifically a Marvel comic book fan. And I had heard that they were interested in 
trying to adapt uh, a Marvel comic book, specifically a black hero. Um, and at the time, sort of the three most well-known were Black Panther, Luke Cage, and Blade. And because Blade was vampire property, New Line reason that they could make it relatively inexpensively. And I agreed, and I was a big fan of, of Blade had debuted in Tomb of Dracula. Uh, Marv Wolfman had created him. I was uh, had read all the Tomb of Dracula comics and had been a big fan of Blade. And I agreed with DeLuca, and I said, I, I think Blade's, Blade's great. And, and DeLuca had no compunction about it being R-rated. Um, New Line had had a lot of success with the Nightmare on Elm Street films, and they'd also had a lot of success with films that were considered, they were called urban at the time, things like House Party and menace to society things like that i believe and um they said great uh, r-rated um we're looking to make it in the six to eight million dollar range i pitched the movie that was basically the movie i actually pitched a trilogy and um and it was exciting because it was the first time in my career and i'd been writing professionally this was 1994 for about five years but it was the first time in my career that I was allowed to write exactly what I wanted to write. And I didn't have a bunch of editorial interference. And DeLuca, I pitched it and I said, do you want an outline? And he said, no, just write it. Write what you want. Write really? Yep. It was amazing. And I wrote what I wanted to write without a lot of silly notes. And um, everyone in Newland loved it. And then they budgeted it. And the budget came in at $48 million. So slightly over 6 to $8 million. And, um, and DeLuca was believed in it enough and was crazy enough to say, screw it, we're going to make it. And at the time, the idea of this R rated superhero pro, you know, project from a character that was not very well known, much less. Um, and then we had budget overages. It ended up costing 55 million. And I remember at the time, because Spawn had not been successful, there was a lot of, uh, chatter that it was going to be another Spawn. And, um, but when I saw the first screening, when Steve Norrington showed his director's cut, um, and I was there with Michael DeLuca, everyone that was in that room, there were maybe 20 people in the room. We knew that we had something amazing. And, and so all the detractors, people that were sort of saying it's going to bomb, we, we knew we were sitting on something really cool. And, um, you know, it, what can I say? It was the first time in my career that, that myself and Wesley and Steve Norrington were just allowed to do what we wanted to do and make the movie that we wanted to make. And I didn't really have that experience again until I worked, you know, years later with Chris Nolan. What was your biggest lesson on Blade? I mean, it, it, it was a great experience. It, it, it had two other movies. You, you actually got a trilogy, whether or not it was the trilogy that you originally pitched is a, is a different story, I would guess. Debatable, yeah. Debatable. Uh, but, but what yeah, was your biggest lesson on Blade? Um, honestly, the, the, the biggest lesson for me was, was just try to stick to your guns. And when we deviated from that, or we, it, it became harder when we were doing the sequels because sometimes there's this, this alchemy when you're doing the first one where a lot of people, maybe even people in, in the company were sort of writing it off and people aren't focusing on it. But I noticed, you know, between Blade and Blade 2 and then Blade 3, suddenly like the amount of people who would show up for the meetings you know, originally the first one, it was just DeLuca. And then occasionally Avi Arad, who had just joined Marvel at the time would show up. And by the second one, maybe 12 people would be there at the meetings. And by the third one, suddenly there's 20 people or 25 people that are offering points of view and showing you a bunch of research on what it should be and what it shouldn't be. And, and it's, it's, it's really hard once something becomes a hit even a modest hit to, to take chances, to swing for the fences. And, and Blade really swung for the fences and became an unexpected hit. And often that's where hits come from because they're not trying to protect against failure. 
they're, they're breaking the formula rather than repeating it. So that, exactly. that makes complete sense. You know, what I've always admired about you as a writer is that you're, you're the real deal, especially when it comes to genre in which you're a fan first. And I'm curious what it was like for you to navigate the, the, the tricky waters of development and development hell specifically, in which I'm sure over the years you've been working with executives who probably weren't comic book fans, but their livelihood, you know, kind of necessitated that they pretend that they are. And yeah. I'm sure you've gotten some pretty bad notes over the years. So if, if you have any funny stories about navigating those tricky waters, I, I would love to hear them. Well, it was hard. I mean, I, I was a diehard comic book fan growing up from the time I was about eight. Um, I was going to the comic book store every week and, um, would, you know, I had a bunch of letters printed in various comic books. I've, I've got a letter in one of the Alan Moore Swamp things and Mark. Really, Grunwald. really, really. Wait, oh, yeah. was it, was it a complaint letter or a, a no, like- no, it was during the American Gothic story. And, and I was surmising what was behind all these sort of eruptions, um, as Swamp Thing and John Constantine were sort of you know, crisscrossing America. And I was, it was my theory as to what was happening, which turned out to be wrong, but I was still excited that I Okay, wait, I'm sorry. Just because you brought that up to jump forward in the future, when you became involved with the Constantine TV show, did you take your original fan theory and incorporate it in the show at all? No, I didn't. Oh man. (laughs) So close. Um, Yeah. But I, I, um, so yeah, I, I, I was a fan and I, I, it was hard in the early days. Um, when we did Blade, it didn't matter because it was, it was considered, it wasn't even a secondary Marvel character. It was a tertiary character. And Marvel, I think, had just gone through bankruptcy and they, they didn't really care in terms of optioning the character. So there, there wasn't a lot of editorial interference with Blade. And Blade wasn't a hallowed character like Batman or Superman. So in terms of changing the canon it's it's less of a tightrope. David, we lost you for a second because of our of our of our strange internet connection. But yes. you were talking about there were there was no editorial interference on on those early movies. And but but then as you worked with more executives and movies started making money, I'm guessing it got more difficult. Well, exactly. Once X Men came out and was successful, and once Blade came out and was successful, then Hollywood realized that there was a lot of gold. And, you know, those hills and, and, and that there was this epiphany with Hollywood that they could adapt. Oh, we don't have to just adapt Spider-Man or Superman. We can adapt something like Blade and it can become a big franchise. So there was sort of this gold rush where all the studios were clamoring for any, you know, Marvel or DC property without often even knowing what they were. And, and there was a, probably a 10 year period where a lot of executives just had no idea what they were doing and, and they would profess to be comic book fans and probably had never read a comic book in their life. And so it was during that period that I actually did an adaptation of Dr. Strange. Uh, for which, for which studio? It was Columbia pictures that before they were even Sony and it was a, a fairly faithful adaptation uh, involving Baron Mordo and Morgana blessing and um, I turned in the script and I was really excited about it. This was one of the ones that got away from me. And I remember the executive at the time saying, we love this script and we want to make it. Uh, but there's a lot of magic in it. And we wish you could take a lot of the magic out. <laughs> and I, and that it was then that I realized that they had no idea what they'd optioned. That they were just, they couldn't, get their hands on one of like the first tier characters. So they'd gone for Dr. Strange. And, um, I remember I kind of snapped back and I said, Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you wanted Dr. Strange, but I guess you wanted Dr. Mundane. And then they fired me. (laughs) They they fired you. Oh yeah. Then they fired me the next day. I I, I just can't imagine an executive saying, yeah, less, less magic, more average. Uh, yeah, or, or, or maybe it's 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 less magic, more strange. Maybe they wanted more strange. That's that's what was missing in your draft. Maybe. They didn't want more strange. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the the executives started understanding what Comic Con parties were rather than exactly what comic books were, and that's gotten better, really. You know, since since 
things have advanced in the OOs, you know, those, those, it, it took a little while to get there, but, but comic book films are being well, taken much more seriously now. If we're talking about adapting comic books as well, I think one of the things that the executives have realized is that you, to a certain extent, you really have to be faithful to the source material. And, you know, the Dark Knight movies were fairly faithful to the source material. And obviously Marvel has had tremendous success really cleaving, you know, very close to the source material. And even though when you're adapting a comic book for film and television, it has to appeal obviously far beyond the core comic book audience. Those fans are, you know, they're the, uh, I think Neil Gaiman refers to them as the yogurt starters. You know, they're the early adopters. They're the people that are going to be the super fans that are going to be chattering about it first. And, you know, so you have to cleave to that. But I also think it's important that you have to ask yourself if these, a lot of these characters have been around for 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 years. And there's a reason why they're perennials. There's a reason why they keep working because certain things about their stories, certain aspects of the canon just work. And with all the different iterations, they work. And so one of the things that I've learned over the years in adapting comic books, and then I've moved it into other uh, pieces of, I hate the phrase IP because it's that's something the studios were in, Intellectual property, right? Yeah, intellectual property. Is that I think it's really important to, when you're adapting these things, to try to understand what, what are the core components of the story? You know, what are the basic elements of the myth that the story is really about? Make sure you understand it. Make sure you you like them and, 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 and identify those first before you create a story. Say, I'm going to identify the, what those elements are. Then I'm going to tell a story using those elements. And if I come up with a story that starts breaking those elements, you shouldn't adapt that property. You should do something else. But, it, but it's a very fine line because it's something that you've done very well in your work. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump forward to, to Batman Begins. Uh, which you co-wrote with director Christopher Nolan as a screenplay, and it, it's it's really incredible because what you what you honed in on on that was that although there's a rich history to Batman, you you guys looked at those years that actually had never been documented uh, in the comics, really, and the closest that anyone got to it was like Frank Miller's Year One, and you know Batman Year One, and so even that is him returning to Gotham. Right. But, but you got where years. he, yeah, that's right. So, so again, a perfect example in which you're, you're meeting fan expectations by being faithful to the narrative and character of Batman, but you're also giving us something new and in, in very exciting ways. At, at what point did you guys decide how you were going to hone in on that? Because it's, it's a perfect way to focus the film. Well, I think that the, um, when you're adapting a very well-known property, having a, a gap or a, a missing years is really exciting because there's an, you know, there have been some little attempts in some of the comic books to fill in that, but nothing that was really considered canon and certainly nothing that had been done much in film or television. And that's exciting because it's, a, it, it's an opportunity to sort of color with inside the lines to fill in, you know, you know, that his parents are going to get shot in crime alley. And you know, there's a period that had at least been adapted uh, by Frank Miller when he'd returned to Gotham, you know, so you know, you've got your A and your B, but then you've got all this sort of free runway in between. And, and that's exciting because it's an ability to really stretch your wings creatively without running up against having to change canon. Um, and when you're dealing with a character as well known as Batman, where even the general public have some conceptions of his origin, um, it, it's a really narrow tightrope that you have to walk when, when you're trying to adhere to pre-existing canon. It, it was, it was a beautiful film. Uh, what was your biggest challenge on Batman Begins? Uh, this is, this is definitely one of the bigger 
budgeted films that you'd worked on. It's it's a completely beloved character. What was what was maybe a scene that you kept coming back to that that you kind of were sweating before you were before you were writing it, and you needed to to have either an epiphany or something else to creatively break through that challenge. I mean, it's funny. The I think when I my first conversation with Chris, he was interested in doing an origin story. He was interested in in telling a story that took place before Bruce Wayne returned to Gotham. So that was something that really excited me when we spoke. Um, and it's funny. I I think that the thing that was the best opportunity and the biggest challenge for Batman Begins was the same thing, which was the only reason Batman Begins happened was because the franchise had been ridden into the ground. And there had been all these attempts. The last Batman film had come out, I think, eight years prior. And there had been all these attempts in the intervening eight years to do different versions of other Batman movies. Friends of mine had worked on some of them from an early version of Batman Superman. And I think there was a version of Batman Beyond. And there was another with that did involve the scarecrow. There'd been all these attempts and they'd each foundered. And I think there was a realization at Warner Brothers at the time that they had to try something new. And it was that opportunity that allowed us to do something new, which now doesn't seem remarkable, but the remarkable thing was what if we just tell the story as if it were a real story and didn't take place within a kind of, fictional comic book world um and, and the fans love the realism i've you know it wouldn't be comic-con without a geek theory and the one geek theory i have for you on that is at the end on the train fight there's a moment where you know ducard aka Raz Ghul, basically has this moment where he knows the train's gonna crash and he's 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 been he's been outdone outwitted by batman and he kind of closes his eyes for a moment and there was there's always this mythology of Raz Ghul potentially being immortal in the comics. Lazarus. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so is him closing his eyes in the train actually activating something that will keep him immortal or am I reading far too into it? I think you're reading far too into it. I certainly, there was never any discussion that Chris or I had about that. Um, See, it, we at least got one geek theory debunked at Comic Cons. So that's 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 all that matters uh, in this. In but this if you thing. think about it, it was it was a fairly realistic approach, and I think if you introduce something like the Lazarus Pit into that, and I'm not saying you couldn't tell a cool story with the Lazarus Pit. I think you could, but I, I just don't think the Lazarus Pit would have gelled with that approach. Well, and it's something that you got back to a little of in in Dark Knight Rises. Well, I think that was just a nod to the idea when 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 Bruce is convalescing in the pit that, you know, he has this this vision of Raj Ghul and or Ducard and um and I then think it can be open to interpretation, you know, was that in his mind or, you know, did he really exist? But he was a phantom. Well, I, I, I know, obviously, you had a story by credit on The Dark Knight, and you know Christopher Nolan and Jonathan Nolan are credited with the screenplay. And you worked on it for a long time, and it's a very intricate structure. And I'm just kind of curious what you could tell us about creating that structure with, with the Nolans, and also, more importantly, the, again, subversion of the Joker origin story. Because it's something that is so beautiful in the film, and you have to kind of scratch your head for a second when you realize the next time he's telling the story that he's making up a, a completely different story. And it was, it was subtle and brilliant all at the same time. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious about the conversations that went into that. Well, I think for the dark Knight, my contribution, um, I had, I, if I remember correctly, I had a limited period of time. I only had six or seven weeks and so what we decided to do was that Chris and I would break the story with old fashioned three by five cards. And then, um, I would do a first draft of, a a treatment. Uh, and I think I ended up writing something that was perhaps 40 pages long. Um, and Chris, I think in turn gave that to Jonah 
and uh, then we they went off from there. But it was it was intricate, and I remember Chris saying at that point. It also became obvious that the movie was going to be longer than 120 minutes. And Chris said you to me at one point, you realize I don't think we're working on a 3X structure anymore. It's a 4X structure. Uh, Interesting. Which I don't advise most people to attempt, but it ended up working out in that case. So we ended up actually breaking that film into four acts. And it was incredibly intricate. And... Um, and, and a juggling act uh, uh, and, and much more kind of, I, I think, novelistic uh, than your standard studio movie. I mean, it really is an epic. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I also subverting genre, the courtroom scene with Harvey Dent, like we know his name. We know he becomes Two-Face. We're waiting to see the acid thrown on him. And then it totally doesn't happen. And you're, as a fan, you're just sitting there almost giggling like, oh, what are they going to do with Harvey Dent? And again, going back to what you were saying about the realism that you, you know, caringly introduced into Batman Begins, again, here, the, the concept of Two-Face, the duality of identity throughout the movie and how Harvey becomes, quote unquote, Two-Face, even in this movie for a short period of time was beautifully done. And at what point did you realize that you just didn't want to, that you wanted to get away from the, the, the typical courtroom scene that everybody knew so well? It's, it's a brilliant idea in retrospect, but I could see it as being kind of risky at the time to, to go that far away. Well, I think that, I, to be honest, I mean, when did that movie come out? In 2008? So we would have been working on it in 2006, 14 years ago. I, I don't remember exactly uh, when that decision was made. Um, but it does go back to that, what I was speaking to about the perils of success. And um, there were a lot more eyes, both in terms of the world and in the studio, uh, on that film than there were sure. with that begins. And it's harder to take risks and it's harder to subvert expectations in success because people want to protect against failure or they want you to do what you did the first time, but just a little bit different. And, um, and one of the scariest things to tell most film executives or even TV executives after having had success in something is, yeah, we're not going to do that. Again, we're going to do something different. And uh, it's, just, it's just human nature. And you talk about conventions. Another convention based on the superhero films that had come out prior to that, the Sam Raimi Spider-Mans and the previous Batman films and the X-Men films, is that it, you see an elaborate origin story of the villain in the film. Um, and... I do remember that when we were talking about, well, what if the Joker doesn't really have an origin story? Even after the success of Batman Begins, that was a, a considered a very controversial thing. And we got a lot of pushback. People were worried, well, you have to have an origin story. How can you not have an, or how can you, people just not know? But I just remember the discussions at the time were that it, it was scarier. And I think it was scarier. Well, and, it, and again, it, it plays into the concept of the Joker as a force of chaos and, and the great speech that Alfred gives that, the, that, you know, was a great monologue the Nolans wrote, you know, explaining about, you know, the tiger in the jungle and, yeah. you know, all, all that stuff, which, which was amazing. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to run out of time. We still have uh, some, some good ground to cover, but I'm going to ask you a kind of lightning round of questions. Just brief sure. answers is fine about your creative habit. How, how often, how, how long do you spend outlining something when you sit down to write? Clearly you use note cards and treatments. What percentage of your screenwriting time would you say goes into the outline? Well, if I'm working on a feature, I would say anywhere from a month to two months. Um, and then how long for the actual screenplay, just for comparison? I would say four to six weeks for okay. the first draft. So longer uh, on the outline to, to know that, to get your footing, to know where you want to go. Yeah. I mean, I tend to do a lot of research 
And uh, I tend to write fairly extensive outlines. And they're always the most painful things to write. The worst part of writing, I find, is figuring out the A to B. It's, it's always easier for people to write, for most people to write the first act because it's all set up and you don't have to pay off anything. And the outline, it's, it's really painful. And a lot of people fight, I, I do too, they fight this impulse to just get started. But if you try to get started and you don't have a really rigorous outline, most of the time what happens is about halfway through the script, you kind of peter out and you get lost and you're floundering around. And I think a lot, certainly a lot of the kinds of films and TV shows that I work on are fairly rigorously plotted. And it's the real initial hard work happens in the outline. It happens in the treatment. When you sit down to write, do you give yourself a page count to hit each day or a certain amount of hours that you want to hit? Typically, uh, if I'm writing the way I write, I will write from around 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, I try to, as much as possible, make it a kind of ritualistic time, period of time. I treat it like a real job. I always go somewhere else. Uh, I don't write in my bedroom. Even if from the very beginning, I didn't write in my bedroom. I went to a physically another place. Turn off my phone. I've got uh, a, com- a program on my computer that disables the internet uh, so that I can't yeah, no distractions. Web surf. Uh, I, I try to hit a page count. I say when I'm humming along, usually about five pages a day is a good, good day for me. That's um, great. You know, and, and I do set page count markers in my calendar that I try to hit. I try, it's, it's, it's like a muscle. It's like running. Ironically, I started running during COVID and, um, and I try not to be too critical about initially what I'm writing. There's sort of a left brain and a right brain. There's a purely creative brain and then there's an editorial brain. So I try to initially, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do a scene or a sequence that even as I'm writing it, I feel isn't quite there. But I think it's important to get through the first draft and then step back. And then it's a little easier to reexamine it and figure things out and rewrite it and um, I, at least I usually go through some form of depression in the middle of, of the script. Uh, I was just working on an episode of something a couple of weeks ago and I came into my wife and I was just in a funk for two days in the middle. And then she said, yeah, but you'll figure it out and you'll rewrite it. And then when I finished, I said, oh yeah, this is, this turned out pretty good. So just keep going. And, and finally, so with writer's oh. block, is that what you do? You just keep going? You're, do you break it yeah. up? Do you just stop for the day? No, I don't. I keep going. I force myself to keep going. I, even it, it, Because if you say, oh, I'm not feeling it today, or at least me, I, if I said I'm going to commit from 10 to 2, then I'll write from 10 to 2. And I'll keep going. And that's, my God, if I just stopped every time I had writer's block, I would never write anything. That's, that's sound advice. Uh, you know, as we're getting into our last 10 or so minutes here, and, and I'm having flashbacks to previous years of Comic-Con with the awesome Comic-Con vol- volunteers, like holding up a card that says 10 minutes left on it. Uh, so, yeah. so as we're getting into our last 10 minutes, I want to I jump into Man of Steel and just, you know, ask you a question or two on that. You know, one of the, one of the scenes that, that that caused some some debate with fans. And by the way, I think debate with fans is healthy as long as it's a non-toxic debate. And sure. we, we could talk about, you know, our past and what we love about the character and what we think the character would do. It's the scene where, where the tornado's happening. And I thought it was a really well-executed scene. And I really like the ideas in it as well. And there's just been this, you know, impulse reaction by fans where they say that like, well, of course he could save him. You know, he, he could, he could fly right, right over there before anyone would notice. And he, he could have saved his dad. And why didn't he? And it, and it just, it caused a lot of, a lot of debate, I guess would be the way to say it. And I just want to hear from you what it meant to you that scene. Well, first of all, I would say that the, you know, it's to a certain extent, it was easier to say, we're going to adapt 
Batman in a realistic way. It was, it's easier to work with a character like Batman realistically than it is with a metahuman from another planet. So applying, there's a higher threshold um, for, you know, suspension of disbelief with Superman than there is with Batman. And it's harder. The, the attempt with Man of Steel was to apply the same kind of standards to tell the story of Man of Steel in a fairly realistic way and to try to really think about what would happen to the world if a character like that emerged. And so the, the entire premise in the movie, movie was that if a character like this emerged from another world who had these kinds of powers, it would be the biggest thing that ever happened in human history. And if it ever happened, I think it would be. I mean, just to know that there was intelligent life on another planet, to know that there's intelligent life on another planet that's vastly superior to us. I mean, I think it would be the biggest thing that would ever happen in human history. So um, what we were attempting to do with that scene with Jonathan, his, his point was not that Clark should never reveal himself. His point was, it's such a monumental decision that he has to be mature enough to really think about the implications of what's going to happen when he does do it. And, you know, I understand that people, some people liked it, some people didn't like that scene, and they say, oh, well, Superman could have figured it out. But what people have to remember is that Clark was only meant to be about 17 at the time. Uh, he was untested, untried, didn't understand the extent of his powers. Yeah, he was he was essentially a deer caught in headlights. So oh, so while he had super speed and super strength, you know, just the cognitive agility to to bear that situation even emotionally. Well, and he also has his father over his head saying, "You got to really be careful. Uh, when you step forward, when the world I don't, I don't believe in, again, who knows, but I don't believe that that the, that Clark, that 17-year-old Clark, could have saved Jonathan without revealing himself. I mean, who knows? It's, uh, I mean, maybe he could have, I don't know. But I don't, I don't think he had the skill. I don't think he right. had the maturity. I'm not saying he couldn't have possibly saved Jonathan. He might have, but I don't think he could have done it without Giving away who he himself. was, yeah. I, yeah, and, and that was Jonathan's point is, you're not old enough. You're not mature enough to do this, to take this on. Yeah. Because it, it's going to change the world and people are going to die. And, the, and, and to his point, which was by intention in the story, is when he does reveal himself, it paints a target on the planet Earth and the other Kryptonians arrive and almost eradicate all life on the planet. Exactly. And, and to that point, another monumental decision was in the end with – you know, the, the essential stalemate that he was getting into with Zod and the decision to have Superman kill Zod, something that, you know, we have been kind of trained and ingrained culturally for the comics and the mythology that that's something that Superman doesn't do, even though in the movie you've shown that there's, there's casualties to their actions. And I, I thought that you guys actually chose the right path in such that there was there wasn't another way to meet that character head on other than to do that. But you, you had told me that you did come up with an alternate. So for the, for the curious fans out there, what was the alternate if Superman didn't kill Zod? And just what are your thoughts about that killing? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. Stalemate is the right word. We were trying to, if you, if you track the story all the way through, uh, in terms of this character emerging and his maturity and under fully understanding the kind of power he has and, and when they fight the kind of devastation that is caused by it, that is not, it's not some frivolous fight that it's almost like nine 11 when they fight. Um, we were trying to come up with a stalemate where he couldn't, we, we couldn't just do a wink. I understand that there was, had been kind of an, there'd been an editorial decision in which uh, Superman doesn't kill it. It was a, it was a rule, but that's a, 
that's a rule that's imposed in a fictional world. And, and we just thought, well, but sometimes whether it's a soldier or people in law enforcement, and again, an immature Superman, this is the first time he's ever flown that story. Um, he'd just flown for the first time days before that. He's not aware of his powers at all or the extent of his powers. Who's finding somebody who's said, I won't stop, who said, you can't put me in a prison. I won't ever stop. We wanted to put him in a stalemate. You know, ironically, there was a scene that um, we wrote that didn't get filmed in which um, Jonathan takes young Clark hunting and um, they kill a deer and young Clark is just gutted by the act. And, and Jonathan says it's, it's, it's a powerful thing to take a life, even if you're forced to take a life. Um, and I always thought it would, would have been interesting to have, to have seen, that was one scene that didn't make it into the, film, the final movie. We never filmed it. But I, like, look, I absolutely understand that uh, a lot of people had problems with it. And you can't, when you're, at least when I have had a hand in adapting these things, you want to be as respectful to the core material as possible, but you also can't protect against failure. You, you have to take big swings. With big swings, there are big rewards. We took enormous swings with Batman Begins and with The Dark Knight that turned out to be well-received, but, you know, we were trying to tell a different kind of Superman story, a Superman story that hadn't been told before. And it required us taking some big swings. And it, we talked about it. We talked about whether or not people would accept it. And, you know, the editorial staff at DC had accepted it. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, it wasn't a mistake, but you can't, if you sit there and you say, oh, I'm, I don't want to take any risk. I don't want to, I'm worried I might offend a portion of the audience. That's, that's not a, I don't think that's a particularly healthy way to try to make a film or a television show. Well, it's, it's a reinvention of mythology in which, you know, nothing's to say that, that for that arc, that because of what he learned from taking someone's life, he then vows to never kill again, you know, well, as, as, as he intention. matures. I mean, so that, that was the, that was the intention. Yeah. That was absolutely the intention. And I think of the films almost as Elseworld stories, um, as Superman, Red Sun, or um, something like that. Uh, to me, the films are, the comic books are the comic books, and, and the films that we were involved in are, are these Elseworld stories that exist within their own universe. And that was the intention, is that, that was, that's the one, that he was in this terrible position and... And that after the words, he vowed that he would, he could never do it again. And it didn't come out of anger. He was forced into it, but that was the one. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious because you, you had told me that there was an alternate idea that you toyed with in case you didn't do the actual death of Zod. Well, it was, the idea was that he, Superman would, that there was one of those sort of cryopods on the, uh, on the, uh, on the on the the ship that ends up becoming the Fortress of Solitude that he's able to put Zod back into and then throw out in space. And we did talk about it, and maybe some people would have been happier with that, but it felt like a cop-out for the story that we were telling. No, and it, and it would repeat previous movies of things that they had that they had done, you know, with 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 Zod and and his and his friends as well. So I it, well I, that was a, that was the other issue was again, right or wrong, and I adore the Donner film, but, you know, we were, this was a new, ver look, Batman and Superman, these other hallowed characters are constantly being reinvented. And the fact is there, there isn't really any real canon prior to Alan Moore writing the killing joke, you know, uh, Barbara Gordon wasn't a paraplegic and, and then someone else comes along and adds something and then that becomes part of the canon and it's adapted and changed again. 
I, I think that that's what stories need is to, is to constantly be retold, but in new and exciting ways. Otherwise, there's no reason to retell them. So, I, so even, even Shakespeare still has new directorial decisions injected into it. Right. There are changing new gender, changing new you know, versions of Macbeth you know, or you have. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I, I think that's great. So I know, I know we're running out of time, but just since we're all in lockdown here, I'm curious what, what the status of your, your, your projects were going into lockdown. I know that, that Sandman, the comic book adaptation is, is, is something that you've been working on as is foundation. What, how were those when, when the lockdown and quarantine began? Yeah. The two things that were occupying most of my time prior to lockdown are these big budget streaming adaptations of both Sandman and Isaac Asimov's Foundation. Um, Foundation was a little further along. We'd filmed about 40% of the first season when we were forced to shut down. And Sandman was supposed to start shooting in May, I believe. We were in the early scripting stage. Alan Heimberg is the day-to-day showrunner on that while I'm handling Foundation uh, and casting um, and things like that. So actually, ironically, both projects are hoping to start shooting again in October, but it's, it's the world changed. And I was over in Europe, uh, where we were at least in, so in regards to America, kind of in the tip of the spear, we were a month or two ahead of, of America and myself and the cast and crew were getting increasingly alarmed in January and February. And we were telling the studios, we think we're going to have to shut down. And at first, everyone in America, everyone really was, or most people weren't, they just, they didn't think it was going to be that bad in America. And over in Europe, we were getting extremely concerned and we ended up on foundation. We stopped shooting on March 12th. I came home that day. It was the day after the president had said he was going to not allow people from Europe back in and you know, it was scary and we went into lockdown and, um, I, you know, personally I was affected with it. My mother ended up, uh, passing away about seven weeks ago from COVID related issues. And so it's, it's my condolences. I'm really sorry to hear about that. Thank you. Um, it's not a hypothetical in my family. Uh, and we had a lot of cast and crew because we were over in Europe that got very sick. So, um, it's a it's a strange it's a strange thing. I've continued working on Foundation and Sandman, and I'm really grateful to be able to continue working. Whereas so many people aren't able to continue working during this period, and and like I said, um, we're hoping it's not as bad now in Europe as as it is in America. So we're hoping to be able to go back and start filming again, um, heading back there in September. We hope. Well, and, but it's and a, I, it's a it's a strange time. And, Time, you know? Yeah, I, I I hope you do wind up getting back there too. And, and you know, and I, I really do admire Comic Con for, you know, they they were a little late to be able to do it. But I know that 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 one of the reasons that they shut down late was because there were so many commitments for a big convention like this that it wasn't until the state was saying that you can't do conventions anymore that everybody was released from their contracts. There was no harm done. And I admire Comic-Con for not only doing the right thing and shutting down so that we could be safe and social distance so that we could come back together again, but for doing online Comic-Con and being able to bring this interview with you to the world, to your fans. So David S. Goyer, thank thank you. you for your time. And, and I can't wait to see what you do next. And I, I think we'll probably reconvene and do another podcast together about some of the other stuff that we missed during this. Uh, I'm Jeff yeah, Goldsmith. Time went by fast. <laughs> it did. It did. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net and the host of the Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast in iTunes and Spotify. Thanking you again for tuning in. And uh, I hope to speak with you soon, David. Thanks a lot. Thank you.